Welcome, and thank you for tuning into this webinar of the series Investor Water Hub. This is part of our speaker series where we bring together expertise from academia, research, and investors on water. This month, we're focusing on assessing water sustainability and investor decision-making by reviewing findings from a recent Dutch study and discussing future trends in evaluating investor performance. My name is Robin Miller, and I'm a manager at Ceres focused on supporting investor engagement on our water program. I'm pleased to be joined by Rick Hodgeboom. Rick holds dual degrees as, or dual roles as a researcher at the University of Twente in the Netherlands and as executive director at the Water Footprint Network. My colleague, Monica Freeman, director of the Investor Water Program at Ceres, will also give an update on Ceres' future plans to dive deeper into assessing investor water performance. I will be moderating this session, and I want to give a note of, my, a note of thanks to my colleagues providing support behind the scenes. Before we dive into the content, I'll provide a few logistical notes. For this webinar, all lines are muted except for our speakers. If you'd like to ask a question or have a comment, please type your question at any point into the chat box at the bottom left, or you can raise your hand and someone will get back to you. We want this session to be interactive, so we'll be trying to unmute lines throughout the presentation so that you can ask your questions directly to Rick and Monica. This webinar is being recorded, and we'll send a link to the recording out to all participants. The recording will also be posted on the Investor Water Toolkit page so you can listen back in and share with your networks. If you run into any technical issues, you can reach out to the numbers on this slide, and I will also make sure they are in the chat feature. So for some background, who are we? For 30 years, Ceres has worked with companies, investors, and other nonprofit organizations to drive sustainable solutions throughout the economy. As a sustainability nonprofit advocacy organization, we pursue this mission via four extensive networks that you can see on this slide. This webinar is specifically put on by the Investor Water Hub as a part of our educational speaker series, seeking to highlight key learnings from academia, science, and investors themselves on the latest of integrating water risks and opportunities into decision-making processes. For those of you who are new to our work, the Series Investor Water Hub is a working group of the Series Investor Network. We have over 100 institutional, institutional investors representing more than 20 trillion in assets under management in this group. We are advised by leading investors and other peer investor networks. And last year, the Investor Water Hub released the Investor Water Toolkit, which is available online and in PDF form as a comprehensive resource to evaluate water risks and investment portfolios. I encourage you to take a look and interact with the data, the case studies, and all the risk frameworks online, and certainly be in touch with the Hub team to learn more. Speaking of, the Series Investor Water Hub is led by a mighty team, directed by Monica Freeman, who you'll hear more from later, and supported by my colleague Hugh Brown and myself. Please reach out to us if you'd like to connect more on our work. As I mentioned previously, Ceres is marking 30 years of driving sustainability solutions in the global economy. We have two major events where you can join us to be part of the celebration. The first is our conference in San Francisco, which will bring together more than 600 influential investors, senior corporate executives, policymakers, and capital market leaders to reaffirm the business case for sustainability and share best practices to empower leadership build solutions, and drive change. The theme is Get Us There. And we'll be focusing on collaboration for, innovation, for innovative solutions. Water will be a highlight this year, and I'll touch more on the specific highlights in the next few slides. You can find the latest agenda and registration details at seriesconference.org. The second event is our 30th anniversary gala in October, and more details will be coming out for that celebration soon. So turning back to the conference, there are a few invitation-only side meetings arranged for Investor Water Hub members and for all Investor Network, Company Network, and Bicep Network members the day before the conference begins. If you're part of our Investor Water Hub or part of our networks, 
um, I'm happy to field any questions that you have on those meetings. At the conference itself, we'll have several sessions focused on water. I'll, hi I'll highlight two of the breakout sessions here. The first is focused on the future of investor water action, where we're, we're pleased to be joined by experts from State Street Global Advisors and Octiam. There will also be a fascinating session unpacking the water risks associated with the agriculture industry in California. And at the plenary stage, we're excited to have Siri's own CEO, Mindy Luber, moderating a panel with Betty Yee from the California State Comptroller's Office, Hank Ovink of the Global High-Level Panel on Water, and Bob Fisher from GAP. That's just a small taste of what's in store for our conference, and we hope to see you there. Now we're ready to dive into the content of the webinar. As a reminder, we'll be opening up for audience Q&A throughout the webinar, so please type your questions into the chat box and we'll do our best to get them in the queue. With that, I'd like to introduce Rick. Rick is the Executive Director at the Water Footprint Network, an international nonprofit partner and donor organization based in the Netherlands. He's also a researcher at the University of Twente, also in the Netherlands, where he has become an expert on global water consumption, and response options for all involved, including consumers, businesses, NGOs, governments, and investors. Finally, Rick is a program manager at the Web Skills Foundation, where he leads and organizes international networking and learning opportunities for students and young professionals in the water sector to find solutions for pressing water issues. After Rick's presentation, we'll be hearing some brief remarks from Monica. And as many of you know, Monica Freeman is the director of the Series Investor Water Program and works with myself and Hugh Brown to drive water awareness within the investment community. As a team, we're also driving research and developments that will advance the field of investor water integration. So we look forward to her remarks later on. So at this point, I will turn the floor over to Rick. Yes, thank you, Robin, and also thank you, Monica. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you for your platform, and uh, thank you all for participating in this, uh, this webinar. For some of you, it's early in the morning. Uh, for us here in the Netherlands, uh, uh, it's uh, about time for dinner. Uh, but first, I hope to share with you today some of the insights uh, I drew from a study I recently concluded with my co-authors. Um, let's see. Yes. Um, Robin already uh, explained a little bit, but let me start with a few notes up front uh, for you to better place me. I am not an insider to the financial sector. Yeah, I'm with Water Footprint Network, uh, an NGO striving to promote the transition to fair and smart use of the world's fresh water uh, using the water footprint concept. Um, but the study I present today was an academic endeavor, uh, born out of sheer scientific curiosity out of my other professional role as a researcher at the University of Twente. And in my research, I focus on management of water systems on a global scale. In short, I investigate how much fresh water we have available on planet Earth, the supply side, if you will. And I try to calculate how much water we use uh, uh, by farms, firms, and families to produce food, feed, fibers, and fuel. In other words, the demand side. So you may have heard figures such as 140 liters of water that are needed for each cup of coffee, for instance. And, uh, well, those kinds of numbers emerge from my and my colleagues' research. I'm basically a water accountant, keeping track of how much comes in and how much is spent uh, so I can see whether we're overspending or not. So I'm speaking uh, with, uh, as an academic uh, um, with a water background, and um, I'm assuming, I am assuming from the registration list that most of you are uh, in the financial sector. So if, therefore, at some point you think uh, this guy is speaking nonsense, that's not how things go in the financial world, uh, well, then you might actually be right, and I hope you'll excuse me for that. Uh, nevertheless, I do hope I can share some insights from, the, uh, from a water perspective on activities relating to the investor community and be helpful in straddling the gap between the investor community and the water community. I'll start with uh, why, why bother about water sustainability in the first place, uh, followed by my definition of it. And next, I'll try to bring it back to the investor context by explaining our assessment framework and its results. Um, then I'd like to focus on the general lessons or main findings I took away from this exercise to conclude with my outlook of what may be on the horizon for investors in relation to the water resources domain. 
Um, why bother about water sustainability in the first place? Now, I'm actually quite an optimist by nature, uh, but I felt I had to show a few grim pictures just to make sure we're on the same page when it comes to the issues I'm talking about and also what we are anticipating towards the future, the, the near future, to establish some sense of urgency on the matter of water sustainability. Because around the world, we see rivers running dry, uh, drained before they reach the ocean because of over-abstraction and needless wasting. Uh, pollution contaminated much of our stocks, particularly groundwater stocks, rendering remaining water sources unsuitable for use. Uh, and we, we turn some rivers into rivers of plastic. Ecosystems are being deprived of water, vital to sustain life. It reduces biodiversity, we're eroding land, we're eroding our resilience to shocks. And competition over limited available resources leads to conflicts and social tensions in many places. Uh, we see subsistence farmers whose crops fail or livestock die, go out of business, uh, migrate may maybe to the city or even abroad to Europe. We see it happening now uh, and they often end up in poverty. Uh, water shortages also ha hamper economic momentum. So a lot of misery, dry rivers, uh, dead fish and deprived communities. Uh, but it happens slowly, not in an instance like a flood or an earthquake. Uh, so you could say it is misery in slow motion misery in slow motion and population growth economic development and climate change are all projected to substantially worsen this misery so how can we change the tide how can we prevent humanity as a whole from uh, crossing certain tipping points or planetary boundaries if you may have heard of those concepts uh, because if we do that may cause us to face living conditions on earth that are far less favorable than we currently know it um, so how can we ensure that ecosystems, societies and economies survive uh, such water crisis or, or even thrive? Um, and for that we really need to fundamentally reconsider how we are dealing with our water systems and how we use our water resources. You see, water availability on a global scale, uh, that's the, 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 the scope of my research, is, is limited. Although it is renewable, and you can only consume it once in a particular place in a particular time. There's therefore an opportunity cost to its use, and I want to know how it is being allocated. At the same time, demand, on the next slide, uh, for that limited fresh water is grave and growing. And we applied the water footprint concept uh, as an indicator for water consumption, and we calculated our human claims on water on green water, uh, that is rainwater, insofar as it doesn't become runoff, blue water, um, that's the surface and groundwater, as we find it in rivers and streams and lakes and aquifers, and also on gray water, which is a measure for pollution. Now, I won't go into the details here, but if we compare the global demand with the global supply map, we see where we are overspending, and thus where water scarcity emerges. And this map shows how often monthly blue water footprints exceed their maximum sustainable level. Or very, very simplified, uh, the situation is bad in the yellow and red areas and green is okay. Um, unfortunately, two-thirds of the global population, uh, which is about four billion people, live in such red areas. Now, such global maps are quite general, I know, and uh, perhaps somewhat abstract, um, but I think it gets exciting if we trace back these scarcity effects to specific human activities. What specifically causes this misery? Can we map that? Um, perhaps no surprise, we can. Uh, so let's zoom into one component of uh, humanity's water footprint um, um, and here we see the water footprint related to Dutch consumption. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands so I selected the Netherlands Dutch consumption and here we traced back uh, water use along the entire value chain of products and services consumed by the Dutch. Everywhere you see a yellow or orangey color water is used to produce things the Dutch eat or buy. Uh, so we, we source our strawberries from Spain and our cotton from Asia or soybean from Brazil and oh, that's, that's quite nice, right? That we can just keep track of our water use to such detailed products or activities. I think at least that's, uh, that's quite exciting. Um, and I, I like this map even more because here we overlaid this footprint of Dutch consumption with the scarcity map. Huh? Remember the red and green colors. And the result shows which part of Dutch water footprints are within ecological boundaries in the green parts or which are not. And 
we find that 43% of our blue water footprint comes at the cost of water needed for the environment. Uh, and of that 43%, 61% is located in just six countries, in Pakistan, the USA, Spain, India, Egypt, and Iran. Uh, for instance, because we source our olives from Spain, uh, our pistachios from Iran, uh, they're all produced in scarce regions. And if you look closely, you see that Pakistan color, colors very red, uh, the number one of the list. And more specifically, that's the Indus Basin that we're looking at. Uh, so let's have a closer look at the next slide. Because that is, or at least that was, or is part of, uh, the Indus River dolphin. <laughs> and this is uh, one of the world's rarest mammals. And it's highly endangered, according to uh, WWF. Um, the populations have declined because of various factors, but in, in large part certainly also due to water pollution, due to pesticide runoff, that can be tied to sugarcane production. Now, sugarcane is exported to the Netherlands, among other countries. So this, this goes to show, this little example, that we can link scarcity to particular products and end users. Uh, here, the sweet tooth of our typical Dutch consumer can be partially connected to decline in endangered Indus river dolphins. And, well, going back to this, uh, the, the, the footprint map, I, I showed it here only for Dutch consumers, but you can imagine that we can make these maps for individual companies and for business activities as well. And we can map entire value chains like this and identify hotspots or regions of concern. So as an investor, for instance, or as an asset manager, do you know or do you want to know or should you know perhaps how your portfolio maps against water scarcity or pollution? Can your business activities be tied to dead dolphins or de deprived communities? What information would you need from potential investees to answer these questions? Uh, that, that's a first hint towards the framework I'll, uh, I'll discuss in a bit. Uh, but aside from using too much water causing scarcity, we are also wasting it uh, needlessly, a lot of it. Uh, so here we traced the water footprint of wheat, global wheat production. And I assumed you figured by now that red is bad and green is good, right? Um, so in the green areas, producers need only 600 liters to produce a ton of product, roughly. Uh, whereas in the red areas, producers need more than double that amount to produce the same amount of wheat, to produce that same ton of wheat. And um, the reason is, in short, the application of inefficient irrigation techniques, uh, such as the sprinkler systems. You can imagine half the water is already lost to the atmosphere before the plants even get the chance to use it to grow. Now, the effects on specific water systems, uh, in another example, trying to tie back particular human products or activities to inefficient use, uh, is shown here in the ruining of the Aral Sea in Central Asia uh, because of inefficient cotton production. And as investor, do you want to invest in activities that, that cause such situations? Or are you at least aware of your funds enabling these kinds of inefficient business practices? Uh, do you have any clue how potential investees score against, say, a benchmark for efficient water use? A benchmark that is, of course, uh, particular for their sector or for their domain. Um, do you encourage adoption of best available water technologies to prevent this? Some questions that I'll come back to in the framework in a bit. But the last issue, oops, is that it? Yeah. The last uh, issue I want to mention shortly is fair sharing. Uh, of water. It, it's a tricky topic, of course, to determine what comprises equitable sharing of water resources, uh, but you can probably imagine that unequitable sharing, uh, especially with the rising pressures and the competition over available resources, uh, may impact business operations, uh, as well as yield undesirable uh, societal uh, consequences. And th this is an example, the pictures you see here for, uh, from Coca-Cola in India. Uh, they had a bottling plant there that was accused of lowering groundwater tables so much uh, that local community wells in the vicinity fell dry, um, and leading to protests and, of course, a lot of reputational damage to Coca-Cola. Um, and as investor, the question then is, wouldn't you want to know if issues over competition and allocation were a reality uh, if you're planning or uh, new business activities or if you're expanding existing ones? Wouldn't you want to know what piece of the local water pie you are claiming for yourself and at what societal cost? Well, 
this is a, was perhaps a, a, a rather lengthy introduction, what I shared about scarcity and wasting and sharing of water, but it all relates to what I refer to as water sustainability. Uh, I, I can sum it up in three dimensions. So sustainable scale, efficient allocation, and equitable uh, distribution. And these three dimensions encompass economic, environmental, and social concerns and are, are widely known or used in uh, sustainability literature. Um, sustainable scale then mainly refers to not using too much in absolute terms uh, to avoid scarcity and um, uh, consuming water at the cost of nature. Efficient allocation means then not wasting it needlessly to avoid inefficient use or, or unproductive use. And equitable distribution alludes to the fair sharing between the various uh, actors, social actors, to mitigate inequality and conflict. So these, these three dimensions, which are widely used in literature, can be operationalized uh, using the water footprint conce uh, concept, but for the sake of time, I won't uh, elaborate on that here. Um, but up front, a few remarks to avoid confusion later on. Water sustainability in this rather broad definition is therefore not the same as water risks. Now, I quickly understood upon diving into the financial uh, world <laughs> that financial folks love to talk about risks, also water risks. Um, but water sustainability in my definition concerns the proper functioning of natural systems for the well-being of uh, societal systems and the enabling of a sustained economic system. Uh, so that's a bit broader. Um, also, uh, considering water sustainability in investment decisions does not merely mean investing in the water sector, uh, so in infrastructure or in treatment facilities or water technologies. Virtually every company depends on water uh, for either its direct operations or in its supply chain, and it's those water considerations we're targeting here. So water sustainability policy should concern investments in any sector, not just in, in infrastructure or in, in water technologies. And also, let me be clear, because I will be uh, uh, talking about investors more from now on, but achieving this broader water sustainability is clearly a shared responsibility and where all actors have to play a role, governments, companies, consumers, uh, and via their portfolio businesses, also investors. So what can investors do? Huh? What is their role? That's what we were interested in here. So tying this whole story together, the whole context uh, to the study we did on investors, yeah, we're getting there, don't worry. Uh, the question we wanted to answer was, how do investors incorporate water sustainability criteria in investment decisions? Now, ideally, we here to uh, look on the ground, uh, investigating each and every company in an investor's portfolio to see how much water they use or pollute or waste and if that is sustainable, efficient and fair in their local context. Uh, uh, but you can also imagine that that's not a very feasible aim for desk-bound academics uh, such as myself. So we had to base our assessment on policy documents released by the investors that we investigated. Uh, publicly disclosed policies, that is, uh, otherwise we wouldn't be able to, uh, to assess them. And first, we developed there for a framework, an assessment framework uh, that you can see here. And it consists of nine categories along the three dimensions of what constitutes water sustainability, as I just explained it. And I, I can be short about it now because uh, of the earlier slides. Um, but the three bottom categories you recognize for the three dimensions, huh? efficient water use, uh, environmental sustainability, and social equity. And these are all split in a part that addresses the direct operations of the companies invested in and a part that addresses the supply chain of prospective in, uh, investment activities. And for most companies, the lion's share of water consumption will be in their supply chain. So it, it's crucial to include a supply chain focus here. Now, that's the core, that's the basis, those three, but you can only substantiate efficient, sustainable, and equitable water use if you know what claim uh, a prospective activity will put on local water resources, right? Like how much water are you going to consume or pollute? Uh, so accounting for water use is an imperative, uh, hence this separate category. 
And finally, there's a category on the top, category A, on disclosure. Uh, that's to allow the general public to hold investors accountable, to facilitate debates on water, uh, and to conveniently also help us base our scores on in this, uh, in this study. Now, behind this framework, uh, there's a lot of detail, I won't go into it, uh, but there are several criteria uh, which we formulated as closed questions within each category. And these answers to these questions result in a score. And um, these questions, um, these are questions an investor's policy uh, could ask prospective investees or should ask about prospective investees if they are to meaningfully assess uh, water-related issues uh, to that investment. Now, we, uh, I hope it will get a little bit more clear when I, I dive into results uh, uh, later on. Um, well, we selected 20 of the largest investors in the Netherlands, banks, pension funds, and insurance companies, and we scored them based on their publicly disclosed policy documents. Now, luckily, I had a student <laughs> I was supervising at the time uh, to help me go through endless ESG analyses and annual reports and CSR reports and sustainability assessments and triple bottom line studies and their websites and what more, uh, trying to find answers to our 50 or so water-related indicators. Uh, so we ended up scrutinizing 226 documents and 44 unique websites for your information. So that took a bit of time. But we managed uh, and ended up with this scoring and ranking. And the colors you see correspond to the assessment categories. And the number you see behind each bar for each of the 20 investors gives the percentage score out of a total maximum score of 100%. Um, the first thing uh, you know, you'll notice, or at least the first thing we'll notice, uh, is the low overall scores. The low total score, even the, the highest scoring investor, in our case NIBC Direct, uh, indicates that investors' ambitions uh, have not trickled down yet to effectuate clear water policy. Um, investors score points on disclosure and reporting. Uh, that's the, the gray category you, you can see on the beginning. Uh, oh, you cannot see my cursor, of course. But the, the gray uh, um, uh, the great category is on, in, on disclosure. So most investors score there, and that's the first readily doable step, right? Uh, but that in and of itself doesn't guarantee water sustainable investment practice. So um, going a bit further in, in, in the accounting category, the orange or brown uh, categories, you also see investors score points, um, but mainly in the operations, in the B category only. And the supply chain part of the value chain is being overlooked. There's not many points scored there. Uh, nevertheless, NIBC tops the list, and um, their scores reflect that they consider each of the dimensions uh, of sustainability in their investment policies, at least to some degree. Uh, they have the whole rainbow of, of colors in their scoring. So let, let's zoom in a little bit to NIBC in the next slide. I hope you can read it. It's a bit small, I know, because this is a still from uh, a small Excel tool that we provide with the paper. Uh, it gives you a glimpse of how uh, scores came about for any investor and indicator combination. Uh, you can see it for yourself how we came to the score. Uh, I'll share a link at the end so you can download it and check it out if you want to. Uh, but here we selected NIBC, and you see they scored full points on... Um, uh, on indicator one of category B, accounting in operations. Uh, by answering this question, does the investor mention aspects of accounting for water use and pollution caused by the operations of its investment? Rather straightforward question, and we found a satisfactory answer for NIBC in their GRI content index, source 11, uh, the yellow marked uh, source. Um, and um, they said no water sources are significantly affected by withdrawal or water use uh, due to NIBC's operations. So, well, this earned them the full two points on this question. Um, but here you can see investors only have to mention something, right, that relates to accounting. They mention something about withdrawal, and they already get the points. Um, well, we roughly followed a progressive scoring approach, meaning that these first question scores can be earned relatively easily. Uh, probing mainly investor awareness on the topic, but scoring on subsequent questions becomes increasingly difficult. Um, so, for example, ah, here we do see a blue background uh, <laughs> for the box. Um, 
If we proceed to another indicator in category G, so that's the blue one in environmental sustainability of the supply chains of prospective investments, uh, that came in the form of this question. Uh, does the investor mention it assesses the water scarcity throughout the year of the water sources used for the supply chain of its investments? Uh, so if you think about that a little bit, water scarcity in the supply chain of investments, scoring on a question like this requires quite a deep understanding, right, of potential water issues on the investor's part. Well, NIBC and their sustainability policy source 18 uh, shows that they do. Um, not only do they consider ecosystem impacts, uh, but they actively take measures to manage these in operations and supply chains of clients. Ah, wonderful. Uh, that, that, we, uh, that makes me happy if, we, if, if I see that kind of, of phrasing. But coming back to my earlier disclaimer that this is based on, on disclosed policies, this is about as deep as we can go or could go. And how this works out on the ground uh, and, and what comprises taking such measures, that is to be seen. Uh, but, it, but at least it goes to show that NIBC, in its water policy, as far as we could find it, is at least aware of the major water issues um, also in the supply chains of prospective investees. Well, there's clearly for each indicator and for each investor, we, we, we can show you these uh, combinations. I, I won't do that here um, for the sake of time. Um, so some major findings that we took from this assessment, we saw good intentions uh, being expressed uh, for, by all investors. All, all investors, for instance, were also signatories of, for instance, the UN's uh, PRIs, the, the Principles for Responsible Investing. Uh, but that didn't really lead to uh, water policy that was being well demarcated. Uh, they scored points on uh, multiple documents, so on, on clauses we found in multiple documents. It's scattered rather than in one referable place. Um, so it, it's not a really coherent whole. Uh, and if it was available, water policy, then it was not very clearly formulated. And the policies were written, for instance, with, with uh, very vague or ambitious, uh, ambiguous, uh, sorry, uh, Turks, uh, terms, uh, uh, or not so meaningful emphasis. So, so for instance, installing water efficient toilets uh, at the investor headquarters. We saw that many times come up. Uh, that's definitely a praiseworthy exercise, and we even decided to award some points for that. Uh, but truly addressing water sustainability goes quite a bit beyond such minor contributions at home. Uh, but unfortunately, that's where it stopped uh, uh, sometimes. Uh, or another example where we saw uh, water savings uh, were claimed uh, because of investments made, uh, preferably expressed in some, some, some relatable terms, such as how many Olympic-sized swimming pools were being saved. Um, that's very nice, but not very meaningful uh, if such a number is not placed in, in a proper context uh, or if it's compared to a standard. If you, if you save 10 Olympic-sized pools, well, maybe with a bit more effort, you, 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 it would not have been unreasonable to expect you to save 100, to, to just give, a, give an example. Um, we also found that the financial sector is unbelievably complex. Um, and of course, as, a, as an academic outsider, uh, that stunned us quite a bit. Uh, and it complicated our, uh, our assessment, of course. Uh, there are so many financial products and there are dedicated funds, there are green funds, there, there are unclear relations between the investor uh, that we investigated and their asset managers, uh, between holding firms and subsidiaries uh, they each often have their own policy documents and at times they are at conflict with one another or at least it's not clear which one is leading uh, or which one they are abiding by. And so you almost need a PhD to just understand how the current system works. <laughs> and sadly that all hampers uh, the development of sound water policies. Um, disclosure I mentioned is getting there and accounting to some degree but more is needed than is the case today to ensure sustainable water practices for instance by looking beyond the fence line and considering supply chains of prospective investment as well in addition uh, to a client's direct operations uh, a positive development that we found was that for several investors, uh, AB and AMRO, for instance, they applied sector-specific water, water policies. So they targeted water-intensive or pollution-prone industries and sectors, such as food and beverage or mining or apparel, uh, to address challenges that are specific to that sector. 
And lastly, well, <laughs> we discovered how a lack of mutual understanding and exchange between the investor community and the water management community inhibits the development of sound, practical, and science-based water policies. Uh, per perhaps you already knew most of what I've shared just now, but uh, most documents that we scrutinize certainly did not demonstrate uh, investors having uh, mastered the insights uh, uh, <laughs> that are relevant in, in, in the water domain. Okay, a bit dangerous, but looking ahead, what do I see on the horizon with, uh, with all this in mind? Um, first, there's an undeniable growth in, uh, in interest from the financial sector in water issues. Uh, there are more and more dedicated events coming up. I see more and more impact or green bonds or other seemingly sustainable investment products being brought to market. Um, we were approached by many of the investors that we investigated in this study afterward uh, to sit with them and to help them improve. Um, and I, I'd say that that's great, right? Um, but on the other hand, it's also about time. Because after all, investors are a powerful actor group and that is only just now starting to assert itself in the water arena. Even though investment decisions made in the boardrooms of investors today profound, profoundly influence the state and shape of tomorrow's water resources. And from the water field, it is clear that uh, pressures on these water resources around the globe will grow. We cannot assume the way we operate businesses tomorrow will be the same as we operate them today. As we are approaching the boundaries, the limits of what our natural system can carry, what our natural system can sustain. And I therefore firmly believe uh, not only that water risks will materialize more often and at higher expense, uh, but also that risk, risk exposure uh, is undoubtedly going to grow. And investors need to become much more aware of this exposure. Uh, by and large, uh, investors are lagging behind corporations who are typically much more water aware of their business activities, uh, perhaps if, as they should. Uh, but even then, I think uh, risk exposure is grossly underestimated uh, by both companies and investors. Um, and I expect amped up regulation to speed up the transition as, as governments are also paying closer attention to water, uh, for instance, by issuing fewer permits or demanding stricter efficiency compliance if they do, um, or adopting water pricing schemes and requiring water neutral spatial planning. Um, many options uh, from the government side here. Um, but in any case, the, the essence of sustainability is to assume a long time horizon. And uh, likewise, investors will have to step away from short range financial performance only, which preoccupies much of the current market, I think, uh, to ensure that continued, uh, continued operations and profitability in the long run. Not just ticking the box eh, for ESG indicators in, in half a day spent per $100 million invested, as we saw is happening today. Not just hide behind your fiduciary duty that only concerns, concerns monetary revenues while environmental and social costs are, are still externalized, uh, but diligently and thoroughly analyzing water-induced implications and opportunities. Um, so progressing uh, in response to these developments first calls for investors to become more aware of the issues faced, and a lot is still to be done here. Uh, but, well, Ceres is clearly doing a great job in educating and sharing insights with the investor community. Uh, this webinar, the work Water Footprint Network is doing may help. Um, and then the next step would be that we see investors start demanding prospective investees uh, to provide them with clear water accounts so they know what amounts of water or pollution they're looking at if they make the investment. And then, as a next step, require them to set targets and meet these targets, substantiated, quantitative, uh, meaningful water reduction targets. Um, and last, these, these targets, uh, if you meet them, they need to carry a substantial weight among all the other KPIs an investor is considering before investing, right? So that water can actually influence uh, whether or not investment decisions are being made. That's maybe more a hope than a, <laughs> than a, than a projection. Um, 
And uh, one thing that investors anticipating these developments can readily start with is uh, by integrating and reviewing their own internal water policies. Uh, I already alluded to the enormous complexity here, um, but, but provide for yourself as investor clarity on which policies are currently leading and logically putting them in one place so you also know what, uh, uh, what documents you are abiding by. Um, or adopt practical, find, develop practical and meaningful investment practices together with the water community and take the vacant position, position of becoming a front runner uh, for other investors to follow. And the last point here is that water is here to stay. Uh, I, I see a clear parallel with the carbon and climate change movement. Um, it took humanity 40 years or so to go from becoming aware climate change was human-induced and in need of taking action to actually taking action. And water crises as the next big challenge for humanity has not been on the agenda for, what, say, more than a decade. Uh, so I think it's therefore safe to say water sustainability will dominate international policy and business agendas for quite some time to come. Uh, but, but I do sincerely hope that we can shorten the duration of coming to meaningful action. Um, we would love uh, to help with our knowledge and our network, so feel free to reach out. Um, I'd also invite you to join Water Footprint Network as perhaps a first step in your water adventure, uh, either with your organization or on your personal account. Uh, we do depend on fees and donations to keep furthering our mission of fair and smart use of water worldwide, so keep us in mind there as well. And lastly, I put up a link to the study here, but I, I guess Robin can share that as well, uh, to the study and, uh, and the Excel file I referred to, should you be interested in that. Um, that's all I have for now, and I'd be happy to take some questions, so thank you. Great. Thanks, Rick. That was a terrific overview and a very detailed presentation on, on such a complex topic. Um, so we do have a few questions. Um, Liz, do you have any thoughts about valuing the water risk of a company? And can you elaborate on steps you would make in such a, such a valuation? Um, well, it, it depends uh, certainly on, ha on how you define water risk. Uh, um, as I explained, I mainly was concerned with water sustainability uh, coming from a water background, not so much uh, how to evaluate risk. So that's a bit dangerous to, uh, um, uh, to comment on. Uh, the only thing I would say is that the risk um, that risks don't materialize as much because, for instance, we are taking water at the cost of nature now and they don't charge us for it. But at some point, uh, a tipping point or a, a planetary or a system boundary, we may hit that point and then costs may go up exponentially. Um, it's very difficult to say when that happens uh, or, or what may be the exact moment that it happens. Um, but those are some considerations uh, uh, that, that you should keep in mind in, in valuing these risks. Uh, and, and that requires taking a long, longer term perspective than just a few years because it may take a while before we get there. Um, so my, my main plea would be to increase awareness on uh, uh, the pending materialization of these water risks and the, uh, the, the probably larger exposure to these risks uh, that we are just currently unaware of. And, and how exactly to evaluate those, uh, I'm, I'm not in the right position to, to comment on that, I think. Great, Haas. Um, Peter was asking, mm -hmm. are you aware of studies of companies that correlate better overall financial performance with better water stewardship practices? Or in other words, do you think that water sustainability can be a signal for better overall company management? Um, there, I have read mixed uh, reports on that. There are some studies that show that indeed uh, uh, better sustainable performance also has a, a better financial performance, but also uh, uh, studies showing the opposite. Uh, I think a lot of confusion arises here from what comprises sustainable practice. Um, uh, because we found many, many different definitions. Uh, for instance, what I refer to with investing in the water sector or investing in water stewardship practices in any, any economic sector, for instance. Um, so that's difficult to say. I would like to believe that it does, um, but I don't know if it always does in at least the short 
uh, the short-term perspectives of investments. And that's also one of the things that we encountered in talking to some of the investors that we assessed after our study. Uh, they were often willing to, um, uh, well, to, 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 how do you say that, to incorporate more the water concerns uh, in, in making investments, uh, but with the, the, in, in, in the current system, they had to uh, get a return on that investment within, say, two years. Um, and that is just too short for some of the, uh, of the technologies that maybe yield a better return over a, a multi-year uh, uh, outview, uh, how do you say it, perspective. Um, so, th yeah, if you need to invest in certain uh, uh, technologies, then you have to spend that money upfront, going at the cost of financial return in the short term. But in the long term, in the long run, at least we can keep our systems going uh, and um, it will pay out then. Uh, so mixed, yeah. a mixed answer. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks for that analysis, um, and thanks, Rick. So now we're going to turn to Monica, who's going to provide some updates on Siri's next steps with assessing investors on water. So, Monica, you can take it away. Hi, this is Monica. Um, as Robin mentioned, I direct the investor water work at Series, along with my teammates, uh, Hugh Brown and Robin Miller and the rest of the Series water team. Uh, first off, I just want to say thank you, Rick, for the fantastic presentation, I was jotting all sorts of comments and notes, um, and I, you know, the reason we really wanted to have you on the webinar series was we just think this is really groundbreaking and very helpful work in um, the investor understanding and investor thinking on water issues. And I wanted to follow up and share with um, the attendees also some of the work that we are looking to do around performance and performance indicators related to investor water awareness and uh, practices. Um, and very much, I would say, inspired by some of Rick's work. Um, as many of you know, um, the Investor Water Toolkit, w which uh, involved uh, about half um, of the Investor Water Hub members, the working group of Series Investor Network on water, um, you know, for a year and a half, we worked together to really bring best practices um, out uh, from the investor community on, on water policies, water practices. Um, and so for some of you that are newer to the space, a lot of the areas that Rick was highlighting and assessing uh, the, the Dutch financial sector on, actually, we do have some ideas and resources for you um, in the Investor Water Toolkit, which is all publicly available. So, for example, in the Investor Water Toolkit chapter on, uh, you know, establishing priorities, we actually have a database of investor policies, um, you know, over 30 policies. Um, that are out there now uh, mentioning water, for example, and many, many other resources on really understanding all the different dimensions of investor water risk, including supply chains, uh, understanding risk by different industries, and how to really build that into your uh, portfolio management and research practices. So we, we um, did want to couple and make sure that folks were aware of um, you know, as, as investors um, will be assessed more on, on their water integration, that there are resources um, to help them along the way. Uh, on that topic as well, one feature we are going to be building onto the Investor Water Toolkit homepage is a self-assessment quiz. So um, it's going to be a set of questions that will be coming out soon, um, really uh, asking, you know, do you have particular policies, do you have particular practices in place, and also performance indicators um, as investors um, to really manage, understand, and mitigate the water risks you have in your portfolios. Um, but I would say also it very much, yes, framing around risk, but also linking to um, driving um, and being a stakeholder around supporting water sustainability and sustainable water management as well. So just asking some of those key questions. Um, and hopefully, um, you know, through the answers and the self-assessment as investors, um, it will also give you advice on where to turn to um, or what to work on for uh, to advance practices. So that's going to be a voluntary sort of self-assessment quiz that will be coming out soon. Um, so look for that. Um, 
I did also want to mention that series will be in the future looking to do um, uh, you know, a, a survey of the broader investor community on water practices as well. So um, very much inspired and looking at some of the work that uh, Rick and team has done, um, but you know, going more broadly um, to, a, to a more global audience and really trying to understand what is the state of play on investor water uh, awareness, policies, practices, and performance uh, around water. And this is um, part of uh, kind of our five-year anniversary from the, our first survey of in investor water practices, which we published in, in the Investor Water Handbook, which is available on Siri's website. But then, you know, five years since that first I would say not particularly scientific. It was more conversational survey, um, but you know, looking to build on that and and understand, um, you know, where investors are now and where we need to go further in the future, and and recognizing it is a journey we are all on. Um, water is hard, but um, there are definitely things that we can start to do and understand, um, but that we all need to uh, work together in the future to really help uh, you know, drive sustainable water management, um, and also at the same time um, uh, you know, align and support fiduciary um, demands as well. So I, I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, you know, one, um, it would also be one core element for a number of the investors on the line is we really also want to understand engagement practices and how to as uh, assess success and, and good work around engagement um, as well. So that, that will be critical. Um, so just wanted to make folks aware of that and we have uh, time for more questions. Then, um, so I was always wanting to adapt this framework to her current business and they're in the waste to energy and waste treatment um, area. Um, and so I was just wondering what, what are the right indicators to measure according to the framework? And this might be a conversation you have after this webinar as well. <laughs> um, well, I would definitely advise you to uh, download the paper and take a look at the indicators that are behind the nine categories that I showed. Uh, the, 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 there are, of course, more indicators in the framework because it's uh, more of a gradual scoring that we did where you also were awarded points for, by showing awareness, even though awareness does not uh, in itself uh, make you water sustainable. Uh, but there are some of the more core indicators um, uh, in the framework um, with how to interpret those. Um, so I guess for the sake of time, I better not go into those here, uh, but the, they clearly relate to uh, um, setting a target on efficiency of water use, setting a target on not exceeding a certain absolute amount of water being consumed in your particular geographical region, um, and making sure there's some fair sharing of those resources uh, um, um, around your business. Um, great. And then we have one final question that seems to be kind of a, it's a big question that we can wrap up with. Um, this is coming from Jesus in the Philippines, who mentioned that the Manila Bay is in dire need of cleaning and restoration of the ecosystem um, by damage from over 60 years of neglect and um, mostly caused by domestic wastewater um, polluting, the, polluting the area. So um, Jesus is wondering how can the international finance community come in to help local investors and technology owners? And this also might be one that Monica has some insights in as well. So well, that's kind of the, a, million, a million, billion, or trillion dollar question, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> yeah, so, so Monica, you want to give it a shot? Or? Yeah, so I would say there's two thoughts. It's, uh, it, it, um, the, the question is excellent, and it really leads to the, the fact that water is such a shared common resource and it won't take, you know, one company or one industry necessarily, you know, to, to play that role to really prevent uh, cumulative impacts. But I think it is a, it recognizes that you, as in the investor community, corporate community, we have to understand um, our role as stakeholders in contributing to these cumulative shared negative impacts on 
on water resources that, you know, entire economies depend on, businesses depend on, communities depend on. Um, I think with the investor community and why it's relevant, and that's a great example, is that there are connections. So, um, you know, Manila Water, I believe, is a publicly listed company you, um, as investors, um, that either own, you know, as shareholders or, you know, lend to the company can, you know, ask uh, certain key critical questions. Um, if, you know, in portfolios, there are companies that have operations or supply chains, you know, in the Manila watershed to really understand those risks and, um, and contribute and, and uh, you know, how they can potentially be mitigated is important as well. You know, certainly there are some companies that are out there that recognize that, you know, certain um, watersheds are vulnerable or are being degraded, you know, to the detriment of all and actually are reinvesting or working with local uh, utilities or groups to try to stop those losses. So there are a lot of different kind of positive pathways we can ignite, um, you know, through our work um, and, and that the investment community can start to understand and, and push for that better change. Great. Well, thanks, Monica, yep. for ending us on a really positive and optimistic note. Um, so with that, we're reaching the top of the hour, and I want to thank you all for your time and attention during this webinar. Please do reach out to me and my colleagues with any questions or follow-up. I'll be circulating the recording and slides and a few links uh, that Rick has mentioned as well. Um, so thanks again, especially to Rick and Monica, for sharing your insights and your expertise with our participants and for all of you for tuning in. So have a great rest of your day.